So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, another episode of Wednesday Musing. And we have a very very interesting topic today, which I'm sure will be relevant to most of us practicing how to handle a patient who has gone online, checked about his symptoms, signs, and comes up comes to us with that knowledge and how to tackle and handle those patients. So. Yeah. Thanks very much, Borade sir, for choosing this topic to speak on. And yeah. now I'd like to invite our convener, Tarang Kerna, to yes. take. What do you, Tarang? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Borade sir, for sparing uh, time for yet another Wednesday meet. And uh, last meet we spoke about the use of social media in our clinical practice, and we discussed about its pros and cons. And let's say probably one of the cons would be that. that the information today is available at just at the click of a button and uh, this can be a boon also to the patient uh, to the doctor to the treating physician but at times it can be also very much energy consuming for the uh, treating physician so that brings us to towards our today's topic that handling of an internet informed patient in clinical practice now borate sir will start with probably which what is the demography or the what category of population and what are the implications what are their what is their aim when they are googling something or searching something on the internet about their symptoms see currently the uh, number of such patients in practices is uh, not very large in uh, say uh, the western countries the number of patient could be about 20% or 30% in indian practices in the metros the percentages of such patients would be similar to that of western countries because india as you know is a very uh, internet developed uh, economy and uh, uh, especially amongst the younger generation uh, so the the profile of uh, people would be like they will be younger people people 25 or less they will be usually having high higher education they would not be like matriculate so less than that and they would also be uh, savvy about the internet uh, they would be uh, routinely involved in um, searching for information or using the internet for whatever they are doing in their lives so this is the profile of most of the patients that will be coming to us who will be informed about the internet but there will be another group of patients who will have relatives who will be internet informed so even if it's an older patient he may actually come with a lot of information which is provided by his son or you know his daughter or you know some younger person so that is why we have to understand that because of the access to information it is not necessarily only young people that will come to us well informed or more informed or more internet informed it could be older patients as well because they may not know how to get information but they have more time to digest and study information if it is provided to them by somebody else so the problem of this is increasing in practice you rightly said that it is not the fact that the patient is informed that bothers the practicing uh, orthopedic surgeon it is the problem that they are not they, because they have some information uh, they think that they know a lot and it is very difficult to explain that information because it takes a lot of time because whatever information they have is usually not specific to their own condition say so that's one problem secondly they read quite often information that is provided by hospitals or private practices which are basically which is promotional information it is not necessarily information in the form of standard practice guidelines or you know like that so they they may have information but it is not necessarily the correct information uh, applicable to their own condition like they may read about some 
promotional or some type of treatment which is not necessary it is being promoted only because the practice wants to uh, promote itself and you may not be interested or you may not consider that as the best treatment one other problem that is a is a real headache for practitioners is patients have some symptoms like they may have knee pain or they may have uh, shoulder pain then they will go and try to find information and then decide that based on that that they have some condition they have this or that or whatever it is they they try to self diagnose themselves and that is another problem because uh, they they uh, it is difficult to and time consuming to to explain to them and once patients have some information they will have lots of questions which they uh, insist that uh, they are answered by the orthopedic surgeons and as uh, i can tell you that uh, some study and research has been done on whatever what information is available on the internet uh, which is easily accessible to the public for example like you and i may be knowing that in uh, uh, google scholar or in uh, uh, pubmed there will be lot of scientific information available and one could get very specific and useful information by uh, accessing and searching for some information for the general public they will just google their symptoms or they will google some condition and the information that is usually available on such uh, public internet platforms is uh, either that put out by private practice groups or by uh, university hospitals or public hospitals uh, and the like now it is surprising to note that in both these uh, groups the amount of information that is useful about common orthopedic conditions and which will be useful to the information uh, patients was not very high in fact in private practice sites the information was little more than in academic sites or you know public hospital sites so most of the information on these sites is what they have who are the doctors working there what facilities they have and they are not really giving a lot of information so this is one thing that we found the other thing was that the information that is provided is often out of date it is not revised it is not updated and that again becomes a problem for both the doctor who has to deal with that information being shared by the patient and for the patient himself because he is learning information that may not necessarily be um, up to date now there is a another aspect of this internet and the use of social media see this is another problem that we must uh, is going to is increasing rapidly that is somebody has some problem and they go to a doctor and they get treated and then they put pictures of their operation they put pictures of what was done and then they say they 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 share what they like they share what they didn't like and suppose they have got some negative comments they will put that on the side and so on so that kind of information is now gradually you know increasing and you can't stop it you know that somebody might put your name i mean somebody might put your hospital and the room that he was in and you know somebody find something that is not acceptable or not proper they might just take pictures or videos and then put them on on their page so this is an increasing now you see now if somebody posts something about some uh, you know knee problem for which some surgery was done now he may post some information he may post good information 
bad information, whatever. Now he, all the people who are following that information will get affected by that. That is the issue. And that again becomes more authentic for them than information which they have searched to get knowledge. So if somebody who is their friend tells them that this is good or this is bad, and in saying so, he may disclose some information which is that doctor told me that operation is wrong, but the other doctor is not going to do it. You know, all that kind of things will also come there. So it is important that doctors understand and realize that these are also now going to be areas that have to be, we have to be very careful about. So uh, one thing that uh, is in, uh, interests all of us is that what do patients look for when they turn to the internet for information. So there was a large study done on this and uh, this data was collected from a university hospital in the US of the searches done, you know, and they found that they shared that information with the researchers. So they found that most people wanted information about some condition, like suppose I have a frozen shoulder or I'm told that I have frozen shoulder. So I will go and type frozen shoulder and want to get information. Then they want information about treatment of that condition. They want information about what are the symptoms of that condition. And they want advice about treatment. And then what happens is, suppose somebody meets uh, their friend who says, Are, I went to hospital and doctor said I have frozen shoulder. And then that patient, after some days, uh, that person starts getting shoulder pain. So he or she concludes that, Are, I also must have shoulder uh, frozen shoulder. So this is what happens. But mostly this is what patients um, want to know. And unfortunately, these things are mostly available on private practice sites. And the patient may go to any site. And what information available is not under control of, under uh, our control because that information is not curated, it is not uh, certified or anything. And there is another problem of patients who have a problem, who are afraid, and the more knowledge they get, because they are not medical persons, they get confounded by that knowledge and become anxious. And they themselves basically are a little anxious to begin with. And then all this information makes them really uh, more and more anxious. Then they search for more and more information. Now, the problem with medical information is that medical science is not perfect. And medical information usually doesn't give you a ready-made solution. Like in other fields, it may be very easy to... to if you want to find out how to clean your air conditioner, you will get very accurate and very proper information that you just follow and it will happen. But we don't have a fixed algorithm. We yeah. Follow up. Yeah, right. And not only that, you see, the patient is not a doctor. So if he thinks that, suppose he has shoulder pain. So when he goes to the internet, he doesn't know whether he has frozen shoulder, he has bicipital tendinitis, whether he has painful arc, whether he has subacromial bursitis, he doesn't know. And he starts guessing. And the other problem that happens with all this is he starts getting worried. Because if he, there it is written that sometimes it, there may be malignancy, there may be cancer also. So then he always assumes the worst. He says that I am the one who is so, in getting information, usually for a person who is not a doctor, leads to quite, in few cases, fear and distress. And the seeking more information leading to further distress. And they have coined the term cyber -contia. And now what happens is, they are why they are afraid and angry is because, you know, 
the internet whatever information it has it doesn't give you any guarantees it doesn't give you any certainties because that's how the human body and medical science is is a evolving science and there is so much that has to be interpreted and so much that has to be analyzed and concluded by the expert the lay person cannot possibly draw those conclusions so the more he learns the more anxious he becomes and these are the patients which are very difficult for us because they are sometimes dissatisfied with a rational and a logical explanation because they have to be convinced of the entire information and the negative effect that an information has had on them uh, and uh, what i find is that even the doctors if they uh, tell them something they take that something and get confused about it and say why did you say this because this is something that i don't have or i have or whatever it is so if you have a patient who is such a patient that you realize that it is very difficult to uh, uh, logically explain and convince the patient and his response to the treatment is also going to be affected then it is necessary to to uh, to uh, take the help of a um, Con- behavioral therapy or a, a psychological counselor because even even before the internet or even patients who are not using the internet there will be a few patients in practice where we find that they may have a physical ailment but the ailment is minor or self uh, healing but their fear about it and their anxiety makes it very difficult for them to respond to treatment because of their what we call as functional overlay or psychosomatic overlay and therefore these patients we take the help of counseling as a tool in addition to whatever treatment we take so the internet informed functional overlay patient is much more difficult to manage than the ordinary patient with functional overlay so this is another thing then what we another study wanted to find out uh, whether the patients who use internet what is their perception of the knowledge they get so most of them uh, were not satisfied with the information and when they met the doctors and the doctors gave them good information and the doctors suggested to them proper sites either their own websites or the hospital websites which gave proper and you know algorithmic information in the way you were talking about or trusted sites which give very good patient education information then their anxieties were uh, relieved and then their uh, propensity to just go and search for information uh was controlled and they realized that it was a better to go to curated or recommended sites recommended by doctors rather than just start looking for information um there is another problem that another study that was done found was that there is a need for good websites there is a need for good patient education data because sometimes what happens is that hospital websites themselves may contain a lot of information which the patient should not have access to so if i go to a website and i should say patient education and the patient clicks on that and then he has a certain amount of information available which is very well designed for the patient to understand which always ends by saying for more information uh, consult a doctor and many of these websites have now evolved 
into a mechanism which allows patients to ask questions. So, when they go to the patient education side and they read some information and they have some questions, they have a mechanism that they can put in that question. And somebody from not necessarily the orthopedic surgeon, but somebody who has information which they can, um, you know, the care manager or uh, physiotherapist or nursing help, will try to understand what is their problem. And based on that, we'll try to explain to them how they can get more information and more reliable treatment. Because the patients may not necessarily be in the same city or may not be able to access that clinic. For example, this kind of facility is offered by like Mayo Clinic or, you know, some other Harvard Medical School or some big uh, organizations have now evolved into places where you can have consultations and ask questions and get your questions and doubts answered. So now we come to the fact, the most important part of this is how to manage patients who have information. Yes, sir, absolutely. So one important thing which I need to emphasize and emphasize and overemphasize is that as doctors, we should never make fun of them. We should never ridicule them. We should, it is very easy for us to, because the way they will tell us about what they have learned, the words they will use, the, the doubts that they will express are usually such that it is very easy to, to find uh, it funny or uh, silly. So we must resist the temptation of, you know, ridiculing, uh, this, uh, all that information is useless, you know, don't, this is no good or like that. Because the patient will feel hurt no matter what uh, information he has. He will feel that all his effort, the doctor has made fun of it. And it will affect their trust in the doctor. They will start suspecting whether this doctor is good and they will find it difficult to have confidence in that doctor just for reason that you have made fun of them or ridiculed them for whatever information they have shared with us. So most important is that we must handle such patients in a positive way and we must approach every facet of the issue. We must retain our medical authority, of course, but we must ensure that patients are both comfortable, validated, and at the same time, well-informed or properly informed. So the first thing is to start by acknowledging the effort. Right. Like, you could say that it's great that you have taken the time to understand your health and treatment options. So patients feel that, okay, whatever I did and shared with the doctor, the doctor is uh, uh, appreciating that. And that makes the further conversation a little positive. Patients, when they meet with skepticism, will recall, uh, recoil they'll feel hurt and they will find it difficult to uh, further cooperate with the doctor in the process. And I've seen this happen even with normal patients, patients who have, don't come with information. If the doctor doesn't uh, treat them properly, if they don't perceive that the doctor is not giving them enough time, the doctor is not sufficiently interested in listening to what they have. The doctor is not sufficiently friendly and reassuring. If the doctor appears to be busy and distracted, the doctor uh, starts hurrying up things. So all these things make patients unhappy, even if there is no problem of internet knowledge. The 
next thing that we have to do is whatever listen to whatever they have to say and then start with okay but let's start with what's your problem how you feel so focus on the patient problem and try to uh, make the patient also understand that all that knowledge let's temporarily keep it on the sidelines and let us find out what is your problem and then whatever we do routinely like we get a history and we uh, do an examination and so on and then it is important that it is explained to them that based on whatever we have heard and whatever we have done we need to have some investigation before we can discuss further and uh, like that so the normal process goes on uh, and at some point when we have explained to them what is their in our opinion what is their problem and what needs to be done uh, in terms of treatment then we can go back to say that uh, if you have any questions we can discuss so we completely keep whatever they had said to the side and if they bring it up then we address whatever they have uh, said or whatever they feel that needs to be clarified now in this whole process we have to maintain our authority as doctors and it is important that we do not disrespect the patient we do not talk down to the patient but at the same time we uh, give the uh, 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 verbal and non verbal uh, message to the patient that we are the ones who have the information and we have the ability to analyze that information use that information to help the patient and once that is done then it is much much better to deal with all the questions that they may have and it's always important that we uh, if the patients say that okay where can i get more information and uh, how can i learn more so i would suggest that all doctors try to develop their own websites with their own information with their own q and a's with their own patient information as a tool for practice because it will help in not only uh, uh, informing and educating patients before they come to see us so a lot of time is saved and a lot of information that you needed to give the patient anyway is absorbed by the patient so when you are sharing that same information opening up that same portal and going and talking about what they have already read it's much easier for them to follow and understand in case you don't have that information uh, that you can refer to uh, on an online basis you can find some trusted sites which are having good information and share them with the patient can you go here and you will find that information again if you do this so if somebody calls and somebody says an appointment that i want to see the doctor for shoulder pain so whoever is taking the appointment can uh, uh, ask the patient if the hospital already has some information that if you have time and if it is possible uh, you can uh, access and read this information otherwise if your your appointment is at 3 o'clock but if we can come say uh, 15 20 minutes earlier we can give you some information here itself which you can see if you make the internet and information and it sharing a part of what you are then it is much better for the patients who are savvy they'll say are ye to acha doctor hai you know he is my kind of doctor but in other patients who may not know about internet they also will feel ki here is a doctor or here is a, 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 a medical establishment which 
insist or is wanting to educate us so it will see people always say you know in the old days the doctor was the you know repository of knowledge so patient ko zaruri nahi tha bolta tha ki hamara health tum bolo karega and aapke hath mein hamari tabiyat ya hamara ye but now that approach in my opinion is not as effective or as useful as the other side is give more information of course one has to be a little uh, selective because there will be a certain number of patients who are afraid of information they are afraid of more knowledge so those patients will say doctor sir tum dekho tum whatever it is you decide whatever you want to treat i don't want to know anything as long as i'm getting all right so once we don't subject every inform every patient that comes to us to uh, unnecessary information uh, we we should be i think erring more on the side of sharing information and using available information on the internet to create a better experience for the patient that is what we should be doing because as time passes and our practices evolve and our society evolves we will then be more and more benefited we will be more and more effective because as more tools come better sources of knowledge come we will then not be found wanting so if we avoid embracing the technology of information to our advantage at some time when we choose to embrace it we will find it more difficult so the earlier we all orthopedic surgeons uh start assuming and uh taking into account information that is available using it to our advantage by uh, by properly channelizing correct information useful information creating our sources of information that is a better way to go than to say that i'll see when it comes i'll 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 uh, since the number of patients that i'm seeing are not that important i'd prefer not to get involved in all this at least that is my uh, belief Yes, sir. Yeah, so excellent, sir. Uh, so to summarize this whole extensive and uh, very insightful information, um, let's say uh, the patients uh, who uh, search the information are the educated ones and the technologically savvy ones or internet savvy ones, and uh, most of the time they land up uh, on promotional pages, which. is not necessary uh, which is not a necessary information for their uh, particular ailment let's say and then uh, a very interesting uh, term you mentioned about cyber chondria yeah so mm-hmm. yeah for the uh, viewers it is probably i may be somewhat wrong or right cyber chondria could be maybe defined as uh, the heightened or increase in the stress and anxiety due to uh, repetitive and continuous search on the internet about the about about their condition if i am even remotely correct that is what is cyber chondria and uh, so i think we have from a healthcare industry we have become a consumer based industry because of the uh, internet like you mentioned that uh, anyone could mention a bad point also and so we have to keep in check our rating especially in metro cities and in corporate hospitals if 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 uh, patient is also in searching about that and interesting and uh, very useful points you have mentioned about how to manage them and uh, if we summarize they could be don't ridicule the patient don't make uh, fun of the information that they have you uh, they have searched and i know it can be very tempting when patients are using using jargons in your field of practice and uh, so try to avoid that acknowledging their efforts is 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 very helpful it would be also very helpful and then separating their symptoms from what information they have very gradually and subtly 
and very important point which i would also like to consider here for myself personally is that maintaining or managing and or or making use uh, of internet as a part of your service like probably making using use of blogs or uh, uh, your uh, own website because that way you can avoid the patient in landing up into other promotional uh, uh, videos or in uh, promotional websites which might uh, not which might lead them to somewhere else so it is better to uh, rather than the patient wandering somewhere else you get hold of hold of them and then you provide them information by yourself whatever is needed to them yeah so sir now we spoke about i just want, want to mention a point what are your views and ashok shams views i think we are getting information at the drop of a hat here today in today's world yes i was just i was just wondering it is not just the internet savvy or the highly educated but i feel anyone who has access to internet is 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 uh, can become a, an internet internet information because just imagine some 20 30 years back if we as a, as a, as a medical fraternity we used if we if we were to provide information on newspapers in newspapers at the 9th or 10th page at some uh, quarter page of the whole newspaper about let's say frozen shoulder and just bring in the scenario which you mentioned that a patient has frozen shoulder he mentions it to to one of his friends and even he feels that he has frozen shoulder so right now in today's world he is having the information about frozen shoulder at the drop of a hat at just one single click but provided in the situation which i am mentioning which i which i have put on if the same information is provided at the 8th or 9th page of a newspaper at some corner i'm not sure i'm 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 rather pretty sure that he wouldn't go and search on about frozen shoulder in our daily newspapers if he if if something like that would have happened few decades back so i think it is because we are see, getting information so easily and see, these patients who are not that educated it is very difficult to tell them that this information is so and so for promotional purpose rather what you have to do is you have to go on some journal or we will share some links with you and go through a very large uh, randomized study and reviews on frozen shoulder and then based on that we'll treat you so that becomes very difficult in such scenarios your views sir on this yeah. see there are two aspects that i feel uh, we need to uh, deal with when patients come to us armed with information first is that many patients come to us who have conditions which are relatively benign and self limiting and can be treated or become better with simple uh, measures and uh, like drugs and you know heat and you know physiotherapy and time you know and uh, quite often uh, those patients need to be explained and reassured that while we are prescribing treatment which may appear to be very simple it is not i mean which they might think is nothing more than you know what they would have got if they had gone to a general practitioner so but that is the correct treatment because large number of such problems or patients with such problems get all right and it is only a small group out of that which may need some additional treatment so this uh, when we interact with patients we have to quite often be very uh, diplomatic in making them understand that simple treatment is not necessarily uh, <clears throat> not good treatment or not good sub enough optimal. treatment simple treatment is not necessarily a sub optimal treatment yeah. yeah so that is one problem other problem is that we also have to explain and make the patients understand that for many orthopedic and traumatic conditions there is more than one treatment option and if there are say more than one option 
all those options are perfectly valid and are likely to produce almost equally good results for example an undisplaced fracture the uh, treating with a plaster may be a perfectly valid option and if the patient is young and wants to get well or quickly and whatever it is a um, internal fixation may be also an option now there are qualitative differences between the speed of recovery perhaps and the comfort and the convenience of the rehabilitation process but it does not deter from the fact that the simpler uh, or the less uh, expensive treatment is necessarily not the best so this idea that there are many or more than one options and as a doctor and as a patient we have to first understand or make the patient understand all the options and then apply the patient's circumstances and the patient's needs and the patient's situation to then uh, through application of those variables the best treatment to that patient now this is the real challenge before every doctor in every patient not only the internet informed patient the internet informed patient is a more difficult uh, challenge because because when he is faced with a choice of options uh, we always have this thing you know we will do something we will say nahi nahi mere ko ye pasand so ek bar wo pasand ho gaya and if the doctor genuinely feels that that is not as good an option then what he feels for him that is where these problems are. and of course so we have to understand these and we have to uh, use our skills and as i said uh, use the knowledge as uh, a asset rather than a liability in dealing with the patients but these two things that sometimes simpler treatments are patients find it that uh, the doctor is not doing the best thing or something like that and sometimes the options that are available the patients have certain opinions which are not necessarily the best for the patient so these are two situations that uh, i feel that um, are going to be uh, slightly complicated by patients who are internet informed before they come but if we use the internet resources effectively and give them access to patient education resources that are simple uncomplicated and uh, easy to digest it is better than giving them too much technically uh, uh, jargon filled uh, data right uh, because it may confuse them sometimes yeah so so on the point of uh, the, the the point which you mentioned that a simple treatment not necessarily should be, would be a suboptimal treatment or there are various uh, forms of treatment for a particular ailment so uh, an analogy would be like in 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 our orthopedic fields in my colleagues and friends they say that uh, uh, they know what to do if they have a ctv patient they know when to do a ponsetti and then after a certain age they'll just send it to me and they tell the patient that he needs to get operated or he needs to get arthrodesis done for example or or maybe cerebral palsy patients as well they'll just right away send away and send it to me like uh, you can do the uh, lengthening etc whatever yeah so that's what we discuss see uh, i the procedures might be very simple probably they might appear very simple pediatric orthopedic procedures but then the timing of the procedures when to do what is very important so i am mentioning this analogy because a patient would google yes, the symptoms yes. the patient yes, would yes, google yes. the symptoms about frozen shoulder but what treatment protocol should be applied to that particular patient is to be decided by the doctor at least that much a privilege should be taken by the doctor in today's world yeah see one one big problem in in your practice in pediatric orthopedics which i find difficult for other orthopedic surgeons to understand and therefore for patients to understand 
right. is that the best treatments for preferred by pediatric orthopedic surgeons are stage treatments. Treatments right. that are not done all at one go and one treatment is done and everything is fine forever. Right. Most of the times, the PED specialist will prefer an option which will do something, then wait for a little while, do something, and then do something, which will give the most optimal result for any patient. Like, for example, in CTV, as you said, you will first try to try the non-operative treatments. Then even if you have to consider operative, you will say, okay, at a certain age, I would prefer to do soft tissue treatments. Another age, if necessary, at that point, I can consider doing a uh, bony operation. Now, all these is not uh, understood or even known properly by the uh, general practitioners or uh, medical doctors from other specialties and even orthopedic surgeons. Sometimes, as you said rightly, that the perception of the specialist has to be explained uh, in a way that the parents and I have noticed that uh, parents, particularly the, uh, the mothers, they need to be uh, uh, reassured that ultimately you will get a normal child. You will. What do you want? I mean, everybody wants uh, a, a child who has got, say, a small foot or a deformed foot or a, to be as good as anybody else. So you have to say that you will always... Um, want that as a specialist and that is why you will prefer staged op options or multiple options because you want to restore anatomy as good as normal and quite often this requires uh, uh, informing the uh, parents or uh, uh, relatives in a way that sometimes needs us to spend more time because it is not easy to give this much information to somebody who has, doesn't know anything, you know. So if you suddenly, you know, like dump a lot of information on them, they will get more confused. So it is a process. And as you rightly pointed out, that uh, these, uh, you know, issues require a lot of uh, counseling and discussion. And that is why I feel that one of the things that orthopedic surgeons should do also is have somebody who is working with them either as a, another orthopedic colleague uh, who is assisting them or ideally a physiotherapist or somebody who is knowledgeable enough so that as they work with you, they become trained in counseling, they become trained in all these things so that more time can be devoted to talking to the patient, explaining to the patient to another person and then uh, explaining in short what you want to say or what they've already absorbed. So, uh, I am more in favor of developing teams because as orthopedic surgeons in the initial stages of our practice, we may have more time and we may be able to give more time in explaining things to our patients in the detailed manner and the time-consuming manner that is required. But we must develop uh, uh, a group of people or teams who can explain these things a little more in detail and with little more time. Because patients always, after you have given them a lot of information, they go out and after some time, they have questions. At that which point, they want to say, but if you say, all right, you can talk to my uh, so-and-so, who will be uh, giving you, uh, taking your measurements or you know, doing some preliminary work, and giving you the appointments, and then they are more comfortable asking those questions, and that person either uh, answers them if they know, or makes a note of all those questions and says, 
don't worry all these questions i have noted and next time you come doctor will be before the uh, further treatment all these questions will be detailed discussed in detail again by yeah so so i would like to share uh, the couple of uh, thoughts on this uh, sure, sure. from the uh, consumer point of view also and from the physician point of view also yeah so uh, there is this uh, gentleman uh, whose name is hitesh ramchandani and who is a motivational speaker quite famous i must say and he is cerebral palsy afflicted uh, individual so yeah. now sometimes you know uh, in the in this world of internet based information and web based information i do really feel if my cp patients watches the videos of that particular gentleman he might get inspired uh, and he might feel uh, uh, persuaded and uh, he might they might uh, uh, follow up reg- regularly with the, this thing with the treatment because uh, cp treatments are, of, are they are full of patients uh, for patients yeah. from the doctors from the patients and the parents as well from the then the therapist as well so but then uh, once uh, one of my colleagues had faced the situation the patient's parents saw those videos and they started expecting their child to have uh, <laughs> results like hitesh ramchandani yeah. now the patient has to understand that what kind of cp your child is having it could be not spastic or dystonic or <laughs> paraplegic or whatever and what uh, cp hitesh ramchandani had the kind of rigorous physiotherapy uh, protocol he must have followed are you willing to follow that as well even if you are uh, for similar uh, spastic you come under so that is where sometimes we do I, this is from the physician point of view and just the other day on a on a, on a very personal experience my dog was not well and uh, yeah. i in and in, in the place where i am staying i yeah. couldn't locate a good uh, vet vet so just and he had maggots and i just googled about maggots on youtube and uh, someone on the youtube said that uh, after the removal of the maggots whatever uh, your the wound dressing and etc is to be done uh, they asked they, they uh, that particular gentleman told to start septran ds did the, the cotrim axisol and sulfasalazine and he was unaware that septran ds is of double strength yeah and later i got to know that he was not a vet but he was a dog trainer okay now it was me who was a doctor myself who is a doctor myself i thought of re- researching i had if the septran double strength is to be given once a day or twice a day but he very blatantly told that it is to be given twice a day for a dog whose weight is under 40 kg so yeah the consumer also who a uh, web based uh, who are googling or using the internet they have to be very much aware who is providing the information how reliable is the information right yes yes so this these are my thoughts on this and now sir when we mentioned about cyber quandary i you also said that therapy is to be uh, suggested to them now i don't you think that suggesting someone who is already you know comes under the term hype cyber chondria who is already whose whose anxiety states are already elevated because of continuous surge about an orthopedic ailment then how do you suggest i know we're suggesting him manual therapy is the right option but then how do you uh, how do you suggest to go about in telling the that already uh, an- anxious patient that he needs therapy um see the the thing is that uh, you have to uh, make the patient uh, give them first the confidence that whatever they have can be made all right you will make them all right they will get better they need not worry uh, and as a part of this they some things they have to do or you feel that that will help them and see it's always important to keep uh, putting this thing that you are going to be okay because reassurance 
is the biggest uh, uh, therapy for a anxious patient reassurance and uh, also uh, to to uh, uh, tell them that you uh, give them certain uh, remedies which are not necessarily part of the treatment but which will help to reduce their anxiety you know for example uh, many patients get so much fixated about their illness that they not only don't want to talk about anything else they stop living their life and they keep whoever they meet so one has to quietly counsel all the family members all the relatives that you engage this person but engage him or her in things other than their illness you know play games with them interest them in watching a film and you know whatever take them for a walk you know you will be surprised that all these simple uh, measures of taking their attention away from their own problem which is tormenting them in their mind they feel better and right, right. They, so better to yeah. refer them yeah no apart no in see what happens now it is very easy for you and me to say you go to a counselor now what happens is uh, patients get confused sometimes they get angry sometimes they become hostile to the idea of counseling because counselors believe that just by talking to the patient they can make them all right and many times they don't understand where as as doctors we also must understand that we must give them simple uh, solutions and particularly the environment in which they come from also we have to find ways of uh, simple ways of solving them every patient will not uh, be amenable or just the moment we decide that the patient has got a psychological overlay we just write there go and see this person and they'll take care of you it's not the right approach i feel sometimes but one other thing i just wanted to mention what you talked about is the need for uh, making the parents of a child with a problem either which is not fully treatable or which is going to uh, they have to deal with disability and overcoming it and the challenges of that kind of problem so in that i very strongly feel that each of us uh, at least who has to deal with children with disabilities should develop what i call as champion parents parents of children who have successfully overcome the mental uh, challenge of getting used to a child who is going to be disabled but who is going to be having the best of their care and the best of what they will offer as parents and not become negatively uh, uh, motivated or become dejected become angry become you know hostile so if you have as you rightly said a few patients who are model patients of club foot patient now if and once you recognize them and tell them and if you say if i have a club foot patient who is very anxious and uh, can i refer him to you or you know can you talk or can you those are the best ways and especially with children with disabilities with sometimes severe disabilities when they get to meet and see another child uh, with parents who has as much or even more disability and the parents tell them no no my child was much worse and over the last two years he has done this 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 and now we are going to do this 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 and in many cities they have there are uh, self help groups of such parents for example in pune there is a big group of uh, parents of uh, cerebral palsy uh, children that provide a lot of help and support so one should encourage development of such champions of self help groups because and one should even uh, you know uh, 
uh, offer your own time, your own resources to such groups for meetings, for, you know, uh, like that. Um, these are what I call uh, very important efforts in treating the family and making the family uh, learn to cope. Because not every family is, it's not easy for everyone. Every family comes with their own set of uh, personal be, uh, personalities, with their uh, social and economic situations, and so on. And uh, I find that, see, for example, you might have a cerebral palsy child who needs treatment, and you would uh, want that patient to come, say, once in two weeks or once in a week and attend physiotherapy. But the patient lives far away and the patient can come and the patient's relatives are poor and they can come only in once in two months. Suppose I'm just saying. Now, in that case, if I were in your place, I would say you come once in two months, but come prepared to stay for one day. I will, the hospital will give you free accommodation because you need to hang around and learn more and more and practice what you have been told. So the physiotherapist in the morning will give you a set of things. You keep doing it the whole day. Whenever she has time, she'll come and look in and see what you're doing and so on. So that when you go back after that one day, you have enough experience and re repetition that the mother of the child or whoever is going to take care will be able to do their job better. So in our practices, in our situations, when we deal with patients who have different economic uh, challenges, we have to have this underlying principle that I will do my best for every one of my patients. I will not say that the only way the child will improve is with this type of treatment or this frequency of treatment. It is not always possible. It is not possible that patients can afford the expensive medication that may be useful that you know sometimes. So all these things uh, are uh, challenges. But also, as I uh, said, in the world of technology, documenting and video doc documenting your successful patients, improved patients, and documenting the opinions and interactions of the parents also might be useful because that is an easier way. Because suppose I am a champion CTAB parent, but you have my video telling um, uh, the world how I coped with it and how my child is doing well, and you have all that, and you have my permission to use it for other patients. Then, I need not physically be there, but even then, you can use my uh, example to, to uh, help other patients. Right, absolutely. So, so let's say uh, uh, web-based information uh, um, can be uh, used or offered as a time and cost-effective alternative in such cases. And uh, especially when the objective uh, is to improve the patient knowledge and probably satisfaction. And uh, then it is very much apt to use this. And uh, uh, for example, today, for, for example um, when we have a patient who has got some uh, shoulder problem and we um, tell him that they have to do certain shoulder exercises, usually we explain the exercises, we demonstrate them to them. We give them a pamphlet uh, which gives the exercises. Along with that, now because of technology, we give them access to our website and a link which will show them those exercises explained in a video by the physiotherapist. So that whenever they start doing the exercise at home, they can just open their mobile phone, link it, and watch it and then. Now, this will make sure that every time they do it, they will get the help. And after the third and fourth time, they will say, I am now able to do exactly what I was supposed to do. 
So now the internet and the technology that it brings brings us a um, what shall we say uh, so much of uh, facilities that some patients may just explain uh, they're very clever and you explain them once they will follow. Some patients need more repetition and we don't have the time. But now internet equalizes everything. Jisko eki bar dikhna hai, wo ek bar dikhne ko expert ho jayega. Jisko das bar dikhne ki zarurat hai, to hi chalega. So, okay, now uh, I'm getting a signal that we have to stop now. Okay. Uh, apologies for that uh, to Ashok Shram, sir. And uh, coincidentally, uh, today is cerebral palsy day. And we spoke about CP patients as well. So that was not the plan, sir. We are sorry yeah. if we have just... No, no, I no, have but... a orthopedic and have crossed the limits. And, uh, no, no, but you, you, gave you... Very good, you gave very good examples. So yeah. we could bring those in. You know. Yeah, yeah. So what are you, Ashok Sam, sir? We had a wonderful chat and we summarized most of the points as well. You are on mute, sir. You are on mute. I think it was a very, very important topic and we covered a lot of ground. The issue with patient education, once it goes there, it becomes quite difficult because, especially in India, especially because of languages spoken by patients, it's difficult to find that kind of knowledge in, in vernacular to explain to patients. It is easier to make in English or um, in a country where there is a standard language. But in India, it is. It, we have tried that, but it is becoming difficult to provide that kind of knowledge and access. So the idea that Sir suggested that individual surgeons can prepare their own repository of knowledge base, which they can share with their patients, especially in vernacular, if they can prepare, that right. will help greatly. Right. See, like, suppose you have a shoulder exercise video which you have taken from a website and you're using. You can do a voiceover in a language that you want and make it available to a given patient. So it's it just requires a little bit of time. Absolutely. Okay. That is, that is the uh, era and the demand now because uh, even in uh, these web channels or Netflix and Disney Hotstar, we are having... Com cricket commentary and then the web series being translated or dubbed in various vernacular languages. So that is the yes. need of the hour. Okay, we had a wonderful uh, talk, a very extensive and very insightful and definitely personally as well, very uh, uh, the management points are very important, which I have taken home today. And uh, not only for orthopedicians, I think uh, every physician would relate to our talk today. No, even we, when we try to find information about cardiology or obstetric analogy, we go to Google and yeah, yeah. we yeah, also so that's what, that's sometimes find it difficult to find the yeah. good content. Yeah, so I myself faced this issue when I mentioned about the my dog's condition and I was uh, in slight doubt if this double strength is necessary and then I later on realized that that was not a vet, it was just a dog trainer. So I consulted a vet in Pune. I consulted a vet in Pune through a friend, and then I got to some this thing. Yeah. Are we off the uh, air now? So you are um, not news. yet, sir. So okay, thanks everyone. We'll be offline now, and we'll see you.